Great. Hey, I'm really happy to be here. I just wanted to make one correction. I, I was the architect of A4, 5, 6, and 7. But I, no, no, no. It's, it's, it's in the Wikipedia page. The, uh, I try to fix it, but they keep putting it back. And uh, I think they think I'm bragging, but it's, it was true. Hey, so I'm here to talk about um, RISC V today, this RISC V conference. And I want to cover a bunch of topics, but the, the wildest thing is with RISC V, anybody can own the world's fastest computing technology, right? And, and there's a really interesting thing that happens with open source. Open source is a one-way door. Whenever somebody goes from a closed proprietary system to open source, they stay on the open source side. So Linux converted everybody. One of the most amazing things is all the AI infrastructure, PyTorch, TensorFlow, is open source, and many of the best models, right? So one of Tens Torrent's mission, I'm gonna tell you about the hardware and software, is to build high-performance RISC-V that anybody can use. And then we're building AI processors with that. And, and I realized this last year is, there are more people building RISC-V CPUs today than any other architecture. Right, does that, that's an amazing thing. And that's because Intel is proprietary. You know, it's only AMD and Intel can do it. And if you try to, they'll sue you. And ARM is a great company, but they license that under very restrictive licenses. And the, the thing that drove us, Tens Torrent, to RISC V is we want to build advanced processors. And we could not change ARM. Right. We could not make the modifications we needed. For AI, you need new data types. There's going to be some interesting uh, connections between AI processors and CPUs. And we, I talked to them. I know those guys pretty well. They, they said no to my requests. And so we're building RISC V where we can do, say yes. And when you can change something, especially in the era of, of accelerating change, that's when innovation really happens. And you can see it already. There's so many companies working on this. You know, mid, especially on the low end and mid-range, one thing Tenstorin wanted to do was bring a really high-end processor that we're free to license to anybody to make modifications. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how we did that. So you guys are starting to get into this, but I just can't stress it enough. We can license our technology to somebody and they could own it, they can make their own changes. You can adopt it quicker because you can modify it to fit your needs. You can change it in the, as you go along. And we are already working on the next generation processor that's gonna be much faster. And I believe that AI is gonna start generating more and more of the code we, write, we run. And the processor that runs that is gonna be very different from today's computer. So, so TensorFlow was created to build AI processors. And then we realized that interaction of AI processors and general purpose computing is very intense. And one of our missions is to bring high performance RISC V to both AI and general purpose computing. All right, so Escalon is our first CPU. Um, it's eight wide, out of order issue, very great branch prediction, data prefetching, three load store units. It's a vector processor. This is built to be among the best processors in the world, and it's our, our first generation. And I have a great team working on it from ARM, NVIDIA, Apple, Intel, AMD, like you name it. Um, we would be able to collect a really great team. And then the next thing is this is now the newest high performance processor being designed. We designed this from scratch in the last two years, which means that we're using all the best tools and the best methodologies and we don't have any overhead from that. And when we talked to customers about it, they said, we, we like that processor, but we don't know. Sometimes you need the highest performance, sometimes the mid-range, sometimes a smaller one. So we built this processor, and I think it's the first high-end processor ever built this way to be parameterizable so we can configure it as eight wide, six wide, four wide, two wide. And the embedded guys like four wide. The mobile market tends to like two big ones, two medium ones, and small ones. And that's because of the diversity of their applications. They want to win the performance on the big ones, but they need the small processors for efficiency. So we build it to be configurable, and some of our customers we've talked to, they want to take our models and then 
do their own configuration and optimization, which we think is doable. To build a, a big server chip and a big HPC chip, you need to have a cluster. So we've built this around an eight, like a one to eight processor cluster, which then can hook up in a scalable network. I'll show you the server chip we're gonna build. Um, it supports very large last level cache and both coherent and non-coherent data transport. And that's because we built this processor to not only be a co coherent CPU, but also work with an AI engine which has very high bandwidth, non-coherent traffic. When you build a processor, just as important as your performance targets and your, um, and, and your methodology, uh, the performance targets and your team is the methodology. So we think this is the first processor built from scratch where every single unit is testable standalone. So the instruction prefetcher, the branch predictor, the register renamer, the execution unit, the floating point unit, the cache, they're all built as standalone independent units, right? And then we leverage, there's some really great new tools so you can create test benches to test your IP standalone, right? So then when you integrate the components of the processor together, we should have very few bugs. And that's been our experience so far. We find 10 times as many bugs at the unit level as the top level. I wanna keep pushing that. And then Tenstorn as a company, we support the Whisper open source uh, reference model. We upgraded that with a vector processor interface. We added to that tracing. I know I've talked to lots of PhD students when they do computer architecture research. They have to spend all this time building a reference model, tracing things so they can do their actual evaluation. And we open source the trace capability. And I've talked to lots of students around the world who say all the computer architecture research is being done on RISC V. And the reason is because you can, right? There's a reference model, you can change it. The students at Berkeley open source the boom and rocket core. They're really good, by the way. Dual, dual issue in order, three issue out of order. We use those in our own development environment. To, we, we test those processors as well as our own and compare them together. Right, so the environment to build a new CPU is really good. And then we're building our CPU, so if somebody licenses it from us and they wanna build their own vector unit, they can build that and then connect it to our processor knowing that the whole thing was built to be modular and put together. And we think that's gonna help that RISC-V revolution that people can build new and different products that way. About a year ago, I believed and then over the next five to 10 years, the RISC-V software environment would catch up with the best in the world. And it's literally accelerated. The number of milestones we've hit in the last year is just amazing. Google decided to port Android, so that's actively working. Rise has announced their consortium of people to coordinate RISC-V development. We partnered with a, a startup in, in India called Bodhi. They hired a team of 35 people and literally in a month or two, brought up in emulation, Linux compiled to RISC-V, a virtualization layer and multiple applications running in an emulation environment. And I won't tell you it was perfect, but it went really fast. And that's partly because of the quality of open source and the number of people, partly because Linux has been ported from Intel to AMD to ARM already. And a whole bunch of the tools are, are actually getting pretty good. And we're, we're promoting uh, our publishing benchmark results using LLVM and GCC for RISC-V, it's already really good. I thought when we started, we'd have like a 30, 40% gap on peak performance. It's more like five to 10%. There's some vectorization stuff to do, but it's actually going really well. So the, 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 the speed of this is just amazing. So now I wanna talk a little bit about AI and CPUs. So. We think there's gonna be tight collaboration between general purpose computing and AI computing. So a CPU may be running like the high level application, dispatching kernels, managing memory, IO data, right? It might handle security virtualization and a single processor then would drive into multiple AI processors. Like that's the first step and we see that now. The next generation will be the Single chip will have AI computing and general purpose computing and they'll collaborate together. 
right? And then the next thing that's going to happen is we're going to use AI to generate both AI models and general purpose models, and the computers we build to, to run that are going to be, let's say, a generation beyond anything we can do today. So, so Tenstor and started building an AI processor, and the first thing we needed is to make a big decision, right? So one way AI processors, like in GPUs when you run AI, you have a large number of very small threads running parallel, right? And it turns out you can do that, but from power efficiency and an area efficiency point of view, a lot of those math kernels are very large, big matrix multiply, very large vectors, right? So we decided to build in a compute block a very large matrix multiplier and very large vector and then drive that with small RISC-V processors. So imagine a, a, a computer program that says, load some data, transform some data, modify the tensor shape, matrix multiply, vector operation, vector operation, modify the data, and then move it somewhere else. We write that as a single program out of our compiler. And then we break it into like five individual components to do data movement, data transformation, computation, and data movement again. And we drive that with a, a small army of RISC-V processors. And the reason we could do it with RISC-V is to do that properly, these processors not only execute RISC-V programs, they communicate with each other. So the load program says, hey, compute, you're ready. Compute says, hey, data transform, you're ready. And we could put the low-level hardware sum before us in that processor, whereas you can't do that with a, if you bought an ARM processor, they're not going to let you modify that RTL to do that. So we were able to take a pretty good processor, build it ourselves, modify it, and then build an AI engine that has a lot more throughput with a lot less, let's say, messing around with vector compilers and lots and lots of threads. So our AI engine looks like a very large compute block that's relatively easy to manage. All right. So we then build that into an array of processors. And then here's the next interesting thing. A GPU has a lot of threads, and they're designed to read and write memory, right? So you fill a GPU with matrix multiply, you read data from memory, you comp compute it, and you write it back. It turns out that demands very high bandwidth. HBM memory is on the high-end GPUs, right? That's very expensive. It's also a lot of power to read write memory all the time. We build an array of processors where each processor is about five tera ops. Per, per little T block on this picture. And then they, they do their work and then when possible, send it to the next array of processors so we can flow data through the whole chip without needing to read and write memory all the time. And it turns out to about, be about three to four times more efficient on memory bandwidth and a considerable savings on power. All right, so to do that, we had to build a pretty high-end software stack. So on the left, we built a compiler we called Buddha. And, and I'll tell you, this is, this is a decision we made, and sometimes we've regretted it, because it's been difficult. You take a high-level program like PyTorch, you read it into our compiler framework, you turn it into a graph. Then we modify that graph to do, there's multiple graph transformations. And then we lower it into ops. And then we use our software to lay all those ops across some large number of AI processors. Okay. We recently, we started last year and we built what we call a metal stack, which means run your software on the metal. And this is something HPC programmers typically like to do. They want to see the vector unit, they want to see exact memory bandwidth, they want to lay all the data out perfectly, and they start the program by writing low-level kernels and then coordinating it through MPI. And we believe now we have both stacks. One is for PyTorch programmers who want to write their code and go and the other is for HPC programmers who want to do the bottoms up method. So here's a, a walkthrough of the top down. So ML framework is something like PyTorch or TensorFlow or JAX. We use an open source tool called TVM, which is the interface to those languages that makes the first level of graph. We lower it to a large number of, of basically mathematical operations for calculations, tensor modifications, and then we have our own autograd in there, so for, for AI stacks, a lot of time we want to take that graph and modify it for training so we can do that ourselves. We also have the ability that somebody wants to run their own 
autograd or optimizer that they can fit in that framework. We parallelize the code and then we literally place it out across our arrays of processors. And I'll show you two examples of that. And then we lower it down to the binaries and then we use actual RISC V compilers at the bottom to compile the individual kernels and data movement to do the right thing. So here's an example of a graph. So our next generation processor, we've included 16 RISC-V processors on one side, and then we have a sea of AI processors. So you could take a graph that said, this piece wants to run on CPUs. The next one, like in two, fits in this array of processors, and so forth. And we can pipeline the, the program on the chip. So this isn't like the static execution you see in a program you say, you know, for I equal one to 100, do this loop until it's done, and do this loop until it's done. This is taking the program and laying it out spatially, and arraying it across multiple processors, and then data can flow through that. So many AI programs naturally turn into data flow, and the graph compilation method lets us do that. On the left side of this picture is a more traditional, what they call metal stack. So this gives programmers access to the low-level hardware, so we call this TT Metal, and that's where you can write low-level kernels, low-level data movement, but then you place it yourself to get the same thing. And the, the automated stack and the, and the manual stack are, are similar in terms of functions, but it's completely different about how you do that yourself to go build a high-performance program. Yeah, here's our roadmap. So our first generation part was a PCI Express device that's easy to plug into a server. Our second generation part is a network processor. And this is kind of wild because there's about 100 processors on that part. It's got 1,600 gigabit Ethernet ports. We can lay those down and connect them all together. And we're building a machine with hundreds of processors all talking together with 100 processors in each one. It's literally 10,000 AI processors that we're targeting with a single compiler. Our next generation is called Black Hole. We're taking that this summer in six nanometer. We brought in, it's, it's a shrunk part, so it's faster and smaller, but we also brought in CPUs. And then we're starting to work on our next generation, which I think is the next step to unlocking computation for everybody, which is to build chiplets. And I'll walk through what that means in some detail. So here's a picture of our wormhole product, Gen 2. So that card right there, see all those connectors, that's 1,600 gigabit Ethernet ports. And that's a 4U server with 32 cards in it. That's a 12 petaflop box at 6 kilowatts. Right, so, so compared to like an A100, it runs two to three times as fast for about a third the cost. Right, and, and some of that's because we don't use HBM. Some of that's because it's much lower power and we can fit more of them in a box. And that gives us a really nice you know, price performance. But that's designed and built to run very large graphs. And here's a simple example. So BERT large is one of the large language models. If you, take, if you look at the model, it looks like a, a sequence of large, what they call heads. And each computation is fairly complicated inside, but it's replicated multiple times. Our compiler sees that and says, oh, I know how to fit this this computation on one chip, so it fills the whole chip with it, and then lays the sequences of them down. In this example, it was 24 chips. So we built a large language model and compiled it with our Buddha compiler entirely from software to lay it out. We now have operations which are bigger where the compiler sees the big block and it spreads across multiple chips and then lays that down. And we hope to demonstrate that on hundreds of chips this year entirely from software. So this is an automated method. So as we're doing this, we're thinking, so AI is really interesting and HPC is really interesting. So in AI, you see applications that want a gigabyte of memory all the way up to a terabyte of memory. We see applications that fit on chip, so they need you know modest amounts of memory bandwidth and other ones that don't fit on chip and need amazing amounts of memory bandwidth. And if you had to build an AI chip for every application, right, it would be too many chips to tape out. And so what's happened in the last couple of years is, um, They've designed some really good organic substrates. 
And then the die to die fi which is both, there's two protocols, UCIE and bunch of wires, where you can send signals at very high speed on the organic substrate at low power. And then that means you don't require a silicon interposer. And we actually have a method to HBM that way. So we don't need that expensive package. And then we can make a set of chips to go build many different products. And this is a picture of our next generation AI chip with an IO chip controller next to it and two memory controllers and a cheap organic package. So this lets us target down to a very low cost point. And we're working with some partners to build an AI chip. We're doing an AI chip and a CPU chip, but there's several memory chips, there's several IO chips, and there's several network processors in design right now. And we'll have a collection of these chips, both for our use and for other people to use. And that, that, that enables more people to participate in building their own systems. Because if you buy a finished product, it is what it is. If you buy chiplets, you can make your chiplets or choose how they go together. And if you build IP, you can make entirely your own product. And I think that's a really interesting direction. So here's a edge server a, a startup is building. So Aegis is our CPU, so it's Escalon, 16 clusters of eight processor Exelon. So this is 128 processor RISC-5 chip. It's their I.O. chip, and then another vendor's memory controller chips. So in an organic package, they can put this together and build a bespoke processor, which I think is pretty good. Here's what we can do at the high end. So this is a multi-petaflop AI processor with 128 processors, and this is where things can really get interesting. So the CPU and the server end, data prep side, wants really large memories. The AI wants high bandwidth HBM memories. And depending on the size of system you're building, you may want really high bandwidth or really different network processing. So this example on one side, it has a Ethernet controller. On the other side, PCI Express. And then the CPU is talking the DDR. And then the AI is talking the HBM. So these are off, it's like our mission is to make these off the shelf chips. So if you like those, you can build a product with that. If you want to license the technology, you could license the RISC-5 or AI technology and build your own chip and your own configuration. But this is going to broaden the number of people who can participate in this. And this, this would compete with the fastest AI processor in the world today. Yeah, it's really cool. So RISC-5 IP and RISC-5 chiplets plus whatever you want to do makes a market solution. So one thing I'm asked, you know, many times is, well, which market are you building it for? Well, we're, we're a design company, right? We're building high-performance CPUs, high-performance AI. We have a big software team that builds that kind of compiler to transform AI programs, right? But the technology that goes into it is really variant, right? I talked to a company building power supplies. They want to put a 50 teraflop chip in a power supply to improve its efficiency. Right? And it turns out for that power supply size, it's a really good trade-off. Right? So AI for power supplies, right? Who would have thought it a couple of years ago? Right? And then there's a whole bunch of edge servers, network processors, video processors. Autom AI is going to be an automotive everywhere. Right? Autonomous driving, infotainment, sound systems, camera processing. AI is going to get built into, into every single piece of that technology. That same AI technology is going to show up in data centers and super large cloud servers. So here's a, an example of an automotive vertical. Right, we can provide today AI cards that run any model. So this turned out to be really important. It's it's fairly easy to build IP and chips with very high flop counts. It turns out to be fairly difficult to build a software technology that enables you to write the programs and get that performance. So we can now demonstrate most models on our hardware. So then people can say, if oh, I bought the IP for that, I could go do that. And then CPUs are easy to value the, you know, like a CPU is a CPU at some level. The cool thing about RISC V is it's your CPU. And then if you need to make modifications or configuration changes, you can do it. Right? The next step is you decide whether you're, you're going to build a new chip where you take all the IP, or are you going to use chiplets to put some of those components together? 
So I built a Hardware 3 at Tesla. And to do that, we built a great new AI engine. We had a really cool compiler strategy, which worked, which I'm, I'm quite happy with. But we also had to build a CPU, a GPU, a DDR controller, PCI Express controller, camera processor, and multiple video interfaces. It turns out we didn't add any value on those IPs. But to build the chip at the cost point we wanted, I had to license a lot of technology and then put it together. It would have been way faster and cheaper for us to, to buy the chiplets for some of those technologies and just build our AI processor, right? So this, this is where you get into the, what do you want to make, what do you want to buy, what do you want to own, right? Which gives you a lot of flexibility to do your own product. So we're really interested in the open business model, right? Because there's so many pieces to this kind of technology and there's so many points that people want to achieve from small numbers of processor at watts to literally hundreds of thousands of processors and data center and compute. Like it's a really broad range. It's a really broad range on the memory technology. And the cool thing is this is going to enable small companies to go innovate. You could go build a better network processor that could then work with a set of chiplets and you have a really great new product. Right? You could go do new memory technologies. I'm talking to a number of people on, on memory technologies. You know, if the only thing you can make is a DRAM that goes into a socket controlled by Intel, right? there's not that many memory technologies. But if there's many ways to get to market with new technologies, it, it creates new opportunities. So, so here's our mission, you know, bring high performance everywhere we can and make it really, really scalable, right? And then build AI the same way we build the, the CPU technology, and it's literally all powered by RISC-V, right? And that's because RISC-V lets you own it and lets you change it and then meet your needs. All right, thanks everybody. What? Is yeah, it, yeah. Is it yeah, sure. Any, okay. If there's any questions, please fire away. Thanks, Jim. Um, I have a question about you. I didn't realize you guys are actually putting a lot of uh, hope on chiplets. Chiplets are not exactly here yet in, a, in terms of uh, available, commercially mm -hmm. available chiplets IP, even mm -hmm. though NVIDIA announced the uh, deal with uh, MediaTek for auto. Mm -hmm. Tell me, who is your chiplet? Uh, partner and how do you see that what are the areas of chiplets that still need to be standardized for you to actually scale the, your chiplet strategy? Yes, yeah, so that's, that's a really great question. So there's two pieces of that. One is what technology are we going to use to build our chiplets? So we're still working with a couple of vendors that die to die fi There's some very good vendors, right? And the next question is what about the standards, right? And, and here's the problem, it's a chicken and an egg. So if we wait for the standard to work, standards go slow, right? So what we've decided to do is, we're working with about four or five companies right now, and we are going to basically build to the standard as best we can, but we're gonna co-simulate together. So we're gonna build a set of chiplets that work together which we think is this really scalable devices. So we have AI and CPU that's scalable, DDR, HBM, there's another memory technology. There's actually several companies who are building like, so there's simple ethernet and then there's real MPU acceleration. Uh, and then the same with PCI Express. There's simple PCI Express and then there's CXL, CXL.mem and pieces. So we're gonna co-simulate together. And that's going to kind of push us through the first wave. Because what I think will happen is the, the committees are making progress. But, but for you to build a chiplet that works to the standard, that will work with somebody else who you didn't talk to, that's two or three years away. So we're taping out uh, something like six chiplets next year, which, which is before the standards are really baked. And then that's to get around the problem. Now, this happened early days of PCI Express. Remember, there used to be PCI Express plug fests, right? And, and I worked on a server where you had the spec, but you also had the errata. 
So you knew this company messed up this and this company messed up that, right? And so when you built your device, when you built a host device, you had to be the smartest one that dealt with all the problems, right? Nowadays, we just don't even think about it. We assume PC Express Gen 5 works in Gen 5, right? But that takes several generations to, to, to straighten out. Now, on the package side, the package stuff is coming along really well. And the, the, the smart thing that UCIE and a bunch of wires guys did is they picked a pitch, 130 micron, driving down to 100 that doesn't require advanced packaging to make it work. And that's because the super low power die to die series are great. Right? And that was a big innovation. We used to, so if you look at the AMD multi chip package, those chips are pretty far apart, and that's pretty close to our real series, right? But when we could package the die really close together and then take a lot of power out of that wire, like that's the thing that made that happen. Now, HBM, it's a, it's a finer pitch, it's 50 micron. And they did that to get the power out of the per lane, but that drove the cost into the package. So that's one of those you know, trade-offs that they made. And, and that, that's kind of constrained HPM out of this, but we have a, we have a way around that problem, and uh, so we can we can deliver HPM performance without HPM package costs. So it's going to be interesting. Like you're right, this is an interesting set of problems, but I, we think it's worth it. Hi, uh, I think uh, I love your uh, story uh, and dream of how the tensors can be successful mm -hmm. with using RISC-V. But I believe the cost of the ownership using RISC-V uh, is still very high. And uh, where do you think um, the RISC-V can break through first? Because as you we know, ARM has tried many times for data center and has, so far hasn't made any breakthrough. So I just want to see your crystal ball on where do you think this is possible to do? Yeah, so that's, <clears throat> yeah, that, that's, that's a good, so here's the problem. You don't break through by storming in the front door, expecting everybody to line up and do it, right? So people built ARM servers and said, hey, it's an ARM server, right? That didn't really work. So what Amazon did was really smart. They built Graviton, and they put it for a narrow range of applications, and then they let it grow organically because it has a real cost and power advantage. Okay, that's one step. The next step is, and you may be familiar with this, India, China, Japan, Singapore, United, uh, United States, and some government agencies in the EU have mandated RISC-V for HPC and some data centers, right? And we're building technology that can be included in those products, right? and we're working with a number of companies who, who say they want to go do that, okay? The next piece for us is we're using our own RISC-V technology in our AI products, right? And again, our AI product is a standalone AI product that can go in a rack and talk to, like say, uh, some kind of a compute server, right? So you have to think about this as not a storm the gates thing, but enable the technology across a lot of different places, right? And if there's a place with a big heterogeneous workload the answer isn't to replace the whole workload all at once. It's to create a lower cost alternative, and then people will say, hey, I could own that technology, right? So right now, you know what the gross margins at NVIDIA are and what they used to be at Intel, for example, right? That's a margin stack, so TSMC makes 50% gross margin, and somebody else makes 60, 70% gross margin. That's a really high margin tax to pay. Right. So people driving a lot of computes can say, I don't have to replace all of it, I can replace 10%, I can buy wafers right from the factory, I can drive costs down. Right. And I think that'll happen over time. Right. And that's where open source comes in, because now you can start to make products that really focus on a market, and that's where a combination of IP sales and chiplets are gonna help. But it's, it's not an overnight thing. This is the step-by-step step so plan. In that direction, do you want to build like a NVIDIA DGX solution that, that has the... Our, our, our Galaxy box right. is a 4U server with 32 chips in it that outperforms the DGX box. Yes. Right. Our, that generation doesn't have much RISC-V performance. It's RISC-V in the AI processors, but we don't have like a RISC-V host, so that still talks over the network to a, like an Intel or AMD CPU. But in our next generation, we'll have RISC-V processors in every single node. 
So it can really be a standalone AI computer. And then in the chiplet world, the customer can say, I want more or less AI versus general purpose computing. And then in the HPC world, people, like Japan's home to some of the best vector computers and vector compilers ever built, right? And we'd love to work with them to say, here's a great processor, let's go work together to go build something that's better because of both technologies. Yeah, it's a great question. But it's not, a, it's not an all or one and done. It's step by step. And ARM is making progress. The nice thing for RISC-V is as they make progress, they're cleaning up a lot of software and making a lot of applications available to RISC-V, which is actually happening. Follow-up question then. Yeah. Do you believe this has potential into uh, other areas such as automotive or IoT devices? Or oh, of course. Yeah, it's like there's, there's so many, RISC-V is going into the low-end IoT devices and embedded computing everywhere. That's partly because of ARM's price, you know, decisions about pricing, right? People want to own their technology, and they also, they want a, a contract that works over the next 10 years, not something that they have to worry about. So, RISC-V's gotten a lot of momentum for that. Like, I thought it'd be a long time before mobile make progress. Multiple companies were working internally on RISC-V mobile, and then Google announced that they're porting Android. Now, we'll see if it's a business strategy, right? It could be, let's go, let's go leverage arm or something, I, I don't know. Like crazy things happen all the time. But the momentum there is pretty good. Yeah, that's a great question. Any other questions? Are we doing good on time, sir? Uh, yes, maybe last one. No, uh, one. So, so, hi. <coughs> Uh, thank you for your great talk. I'm a researcher and an engineer in HPC area, so I very, I'm very inter interested in uh, uh, many core architecture, like gray scale. Mm -hmm. But I have no idea how do I implement my application onto that uh, large or uh, many super co computer, uh, many uh, PCs. So I have a not good uh, experience at the uh, Xeon Phi, and it uh, has many uh, cores, but mm -hmm. uh, it. Uh, yeah, uh, it does work as I expected. So, what the difference between I mean a key technology to make your uh, program uh, uh, no your uh, gray square uh, distinguish from other uh, menu core architecture? Okay, let me tell you. So, people in the past have built computers with lots of processors and dense compute, but then they didn't deliver the software to let you do it, and 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 that's the, that's the real hard part. So our AI processors, like I said, if you look inside each processor, there's a, there's a processor feeding the compute, which existed in those, a, those Intel processors. But there's also several processors whose job it is to move data, transform the data, and manage the local buffering. And that, the software for those is written by the graph compiler. So if you can describe your problem as a graph, right, our, our compiler takes that apart and then lays out that, that all that software, balances the compute between the different nodes, because we can develop models for each kind of compute, right? And then you can run it, and then we can give you a visualization back to say, this is how your computer is running. This is too fast, this is too slow, too much bandwidth here, and then we can, we can balance it out. So it's the, the compilation is the hard thing. And by the way, it's been hard for us to do. Uh, but we feel like we're starting to really make progress on that. Okay, so it means that we might want to have um, a new language to describe the data flow, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you for your great answer. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very All much. All right. Thank so you. Thank you very much. So, I really appreciate it. it was, so, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for Jim. Just uh, one thing. So at the end of the book, there's this section of a gra graph compiler that Jim has just actually described about. Yeah. Okay. FYI, so that's all. <laughs>